Hey everybody, how's it going? Hi out there in Facebook land and wherever you're watching from, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name's Riley and I'll be with you this afternoon and we're going to be talking about guitar amps. Um, primarily Guitar Amps 101. Uh, again, if you missed our kind of intro about a half hour ago, uh, we're going to be covering a lot of basics in terms of amplifiers, you know, for, uh, for those who may not be as, as technically savvy or may not just may not know what they want uh, out of a guitar amp. So we're going to be talking about uh, tube amps, digital amps, modeling amps, uh, and the differences between all of those. We're going to be talking about wattage and tubes and uh, cabinet and speaker sizes. We're going to cover a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, so let's, let's, uh, let's get rolling here. So what is an amp? The literally most basic question we can ask ourselves. A, a, an amp is a system uh, that amplifies your electric guitar signal using a specific circuit when it's paired with uh, a loudspeaker or speakers in, in plural. Uh, it allows you to shape the sound of your electric guitar uh, and, and fit your volume uh, to whatever use you may, you may need it for. Now, um, how amps kind of came about, uh, we have to go way far back and, and talk about, uh, you know, in the 30s and 40s when, when big band music was really, really popular um, and the guitar players in those bands were playing these really large bodied, you know, kind of gypsy style uh, acoustics so that they could try and keep up with the volume of the big bands. Uh, eventually they proved that was, uh, that was next to impossible. It never really worked that well. So, um, you know, into the uh, early 50s, you basically had the first electric guitar amps so that people could be loud, they could be heard. You know, they were designed to be loud and clean and clear so that you could play along with a band. Um, you know, and then drummers became more popular around that time too. So uh, that's kind of how it all got started. The, the guitar amp really is where your guitar tone uh, happens. It's where it begins. It's if you didn't have an amp and you just had an electric guitar with nothing plugged into it, you would just hear the resonance of the wood. You wouldn't be able to hear anything really. So the amp really is a, a huge key to your sound and, and to your tone. Um, so as I said before, we're, uh, we're going to be talking, uh, you know, covering three main types of amps, tube or valve amps, valve is what they call it across the pond, uh, solid state amps, and then a di a digital and modeling, and we'll talk about those uh, in depth as we go. So um, we're going to start with tube amps, you know, plain and simple. Uh, tube amps use vacuum tubes to amplify the power of the guitar signal. Um, they generally have a really warm and very natural uh, sound to them. It, it's usually why people uh, are so privy to them and, and tend to prefer a tube amp is that warm, natural sound. They're also very touch sensitive. So if you are playing the guitar through it and, uh, and you play softly, the guitar is, or the amp sorry, is going to react to that. Um, that softer playing, it's, it's going to soften up and it's going to become a little more clear, a little less driven. And then if you really dig into it, you pick really hard and you play more aggressively, the amp is going it, to, it, it's really going to respond to that. It's going to get a little beefier. It'll, it may even cause the amp to distort a bit, which, you know, which, which we all love. So, um, and on that note, uh, amps do, tube amps, sorry, do give some natural uh, distortion when you, when you crank them up. Um, some amps have a master volume, other amps have a non-master volume. Uh, we're going to talk about a bit more about that later, but generally, um, you know, the louder you play the amp, the, the, it actually tends, the tubes tend to break up and give you this really nice natural overdrive uh, or, or distortion. Um, even some of the older ones, you know, some of the greatest tones we've ever heard uh, were, you know, just a cranked up little tube amp. So. Um, another thing about tube amps, uh, th they really have uh, very minimal to, to no effects uh, built into them. They, uh, you know, some may have uh, reverb, you know, if you look at any Fender or Vox amps, they usually have like a spring reverb tank uh, that's set uh, in them as well. So you can get this kind of echoey, kind of roomy, roomy effect, but generally not much else. Other amps may offer like a trem or something, like a tube driven tremolo uh, kind of sound that kind of, you know, where that volume kind of comes in and out, gives you that kind of wavy kind of sound. Um, tube amps are loud. And I can't, I can't stress this enough. Tube amps are loud. Uh, as I said before, that really is why they were made. They were made to be loud, to be heard. And, uh, and they've definitely been taken to those incredible heights. You know, you see those giant stadium shows where they, they have a wall of tube amps and cabinets. And, it, and back in the day, that was all too, um, it was all to, to make sure that the guitar was heard. It was back at a time when, when PA systems didn't really exist. There was nothing to amplify the guitar. So 
Um, tube amps are loud. Even at their uh, lower wattage settings, even one watt uh, can, be, can be quite loud. And it's sometimes, uh, it's sometimes what makes um, people wanting to own a tube amp a little difficult, especially if you've got to be you know, kind of quiet and whatnot. But we'll, we'll talk more about that uh, in a little bit as well. Um, about the tubes themselves, depending on the type of tube that's in the amp, it really is going to affect what kind of sound uh, comes, th comes out of that amp. Different amps require different specific power tubes and it's basically just what they're wired to accept to go for this particular sound. Um, and depending on the wattage of the amp uh, the t uh, and the tubes required, there will be a difference between um, how much headroom the amp has and how much or, or how much the amp is, is actually naturally going to distort. So, so what, is, what is headroom? Headroom um, is how loud you can get the amp before it naturally starts to distort. So you may find that, that there are certain amps that are designed to have, you know, they use a specific kind of tube and, they're, and they have a very high wattage. They're more powerful, that meaning that you can turn them up louder and they're gonna stay nice and clean. They're going to, they're not gonna break up. They're gonna give you this, this pure, loud, clean sound. Um, but eventually every tube amp will start to, you know, distort the, the harder you, you crank it, the louder that you make it. Um, and then other amps, uh, you know, are designed, other tubes, I should say, um, are definitely designed to give you a bit of a different, uh, a different sound and a different response. So let's go through a couple of the different types of tubes uh, that, that are more commonly used uh, in most amps. These are just some of the more popular ones. There are some different ones, uh, but these are kind of the more wide, widely used. Um, so first we've got the, the 6L6 tube. Um, mind you, these, these tubes here, the 6L6, the 6V6, and the EL34, EL84, they are what, are what are what are called your power tubes. That's where all your your power and your volume really come from. Um, so there's two different sets of tubes that are generally used in a tube amp. You have your 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 power tubes, which are going to be the bigger tubes that you see. Usually they're in, in in pairs or in fours, you know, depending on the amp. And then you have those uh, you know two or three little tubes on the end, and those are your preamp tubes. That's where like if you're Amp has a master volume, for example, it's where a lot of your gain is going to come from and, uh, you know, and they do serve some other purposes in the circuitry uh, as well. But those are the two types. You have your preamp tubes, the little guys, and your power tubes that are your, your, your bigger guys in there. So, um, so 6L6 kind of give you the, the highest amount of headroom generally, very, a very American sounding tube and, and you may hear that term a lot, um, the American, an American amp, what it, what, you know, what's that American amp sound? Um, generally referred to, uh, you know, um, in reference to Fender uh, or, or Mesa Boogie amps, um, designed initially to, uh, like what we were saying before, to be loud and clean and just nice and nice and pristine. Um, and again, they will have a different kind of uh, tone if you really drive them. Like if you turned a deluxe reverb up all the way, for example, uh, and you really crank that up, or a super, you know, a super reverb is probably a better example with those, uh, the 6L6s. Um, when you turn it up and, and those tubes start to distort, the 6L6 is a little stiff. Um, it, it, you know, it's not going to be as forgiving. It's not really going to be as smooth. So it definitely gives you a different flavor of overdrive when you crank them up. But again, when these kind of came out, they, that wasn't their goal. Their goal wasn't to have, uh, you know, have it be a, a dirty, um, you know, crazy monster. They just wanted it to be loud and they wanted it to be clean. So that's kind of uh, where the 6L6 fits in. Now the little brother of the 6L6 is the 6V6, uh, which is a bit shorter, a bit smaller uh, in stature. I think I've actually got a picture of one up there in the corner. Um, and uh, they, these do distort more easily at lower volumes. Uh, again, another American sounding tube, um, but tend to have a little bit less low end when they're turned up, uh, when they're turned up loud, again, because you're getting more of that natural distortion, um, more popular in kind of those smaller, um, smaller wattage uh, amps there. Um, moving on from the 6V6, we have the EL34, which is, it, it's, it, this is the British tube. You know, so on one hand you have American, and then on the other hand you have British. British is your Marshall sound. You know, your Marshall, your your orange, that kind of thing. They really offer this uh, this really rich and sm and smooth kind of uh, natural distortion with them. They're kind of 
designed uh, to get you that crunch, and that's something that that uh, Marshall definitely had figured out uh, in the in the 70s. Uh, so that EL34 really not as much, you know, good for that that clean kind of headroom that we were talking about. But definitely, if you're looking for more of a natural kind of distortion out of your amp, it's uh, you know, you, you really it's hard to compete with them. Um, you'll also have the little brother to the EL34, which is the uh, EL84. Another very, very popular British tube. Uh, those are kind of the two main tubes there for, for Britain, the 34 and the, and the 84. The 84 you find more in, in Vox amps. They, they have this very kind of chimey quality to them, also a very kind of treble-driven uh, overdrive. You know, the, the, the saturation that you get is very, can be kind of crispy, um, not not uh, you know um, not really as shrill or anything like that, uh, but um, but definitely a different sound. They're definitely it maybe not as bass heavy. Uh, you know, think Brian May, think Queen. You know, he was having he had his AC30 Vox that was just cranked up uh, a lot here. Uh, let's see what we got going on. Um, so Eric says, uh, what should we be listening for if we think a tube is dying? Uh, and how do we know when to change them? That, it's a good question, good question. So um, I don't know if you'll really initially to be able to tell if a tube is dying. Um, I, I'd say a good, it, it's hard to say. It's something that can happen, that usually tends to happen slowly uh, over time. Uh, definitely, you know, a good rule of thumb I kind of like to use. Uh, and, you know, if anyone else has any other opinions on this, please, please chime in. But, but from, from my, my experience, I find that if you're gigging a lot, you know, if you're gigging every weekend, if you're cranking that amp up, if you're playing loud very regularly every week, multiple times a week, you should probably retube your amp once a year-ish, you know, something around there. If you're more of a at-home basement player, you know, you don't, you don't ever play very loud, you're just kind of keep playing to yourself, you're not really pushing the amp that hard, usually a few years you know, four, five years maybe, it depends. What, what I've found and, and the conversations I've had with people is, you know, one day you might just plug in your amp and be like, this does not sound as good as I, th as I thought it did. You know, it might sound kind of dull. It might sound a little muddy, you know. I, I think that mud is kind of very, very clear uh, to hear. Like one day you might just turn it on and be like, this, like, this sounds a little muddy. This doesn't sound as clear. It doesn't sound as crisp. It doesn't sound as lively as maybe it used to. Uh, you know, so that's a good, that's a pretty good indicator. Um, yeah, a uh, microphonic tube, uh, you know, is another thing to touch on. You may find that, uh, you know, sometimes your amp may have, uh, I've had ones where it, it started like a, like a low squeal and it maybe kind of gets a little louder. You also may find that if you turn on your amp one day and it sounds like it's not giving you any sound, so then you turn it up and when you turn it up, you actually do get some sound out of it. You, in most cases that I've seen, usually that just means you have a bad preamp tube. Um, and now, and on that, um, I would say your preamp tubes uh, are more likely to wear out before your power tubes. Um, your power tubes definitely take a little bit longer. Uh, the signal goes, uh, you know, will go through your preamp section first before it goes to the power section. So you have more power going through there first than the, than the power section. So your, your, your 12AX7s, your, your little preamp tubes, um, or 12AT7s as, as I've got on the slide there, you know, depending on the amp, they may take uh, some different uh, some different models uh, and they do just offer some different sounds but generally those tubes are the one to go first a good way to test it if it's microphonic is when it's all plugged in and obviously and please be careful when you do this you know you can usually take the back panel of your amp off um, you know have it have something hooked up have the volume up so you can hear what's coming out of the speaker and you can usually take a pencil or a pen and just kind of tap the tube and if you can hear the plinkiness of the glass of the tube through the speaker usually means that, that, that it can be microphonic. Um, I'm by no means uh, an amp tech uh, expert. You know, I don't build them. Um, I think I would know enough, uh, you know, to, to change my own tubes and to do some basic stuff. But, uh, but any more, um, you know, th there may be some uh, more particular, particularly skilled people in the comments questions that could, uh, that could answer some more um, specific electronic questions there, but but I think that's about it. You know, change them once a year if you're gigging a lot. Once every few years if you're not. Um, and uh, and, I, and actually, yeah, Brandon, you have a really good point here. Brandon says, uh, you know, uh, my thoughts on properly powering up and turning off tube amps. Uh, for sure, um, 
as, as you can see here, and I don't know, Matt, if, uh, if you can zoom in on this here, you can see on this, on um, the JCM800 that I have here behind me, uh, it has a power and a standby switch, and most tube amps uh, are going to have this. Uh, some don't anymore, you know, that they figured out a way to wire it where you don't necessarily need one of these. Um, but generally, you want to um, turn on your, actually, and even before you turn on your amp, always make sure it's connected to a load. Always make sure it's connected to a speaker or a load box, you know, like what we've got here. And we'll get into this stuff a little later as well. But um, if your amp does not have a load, it creates a lot of stress on your power tubes and your transformer. So if you ever, you know, are trying to get sound out of your amp and you're not, make sure it's plugged in uh, to a speaker or, or a load properly before you turn it on. So, so once we do that, you basically want to let your tubes warm up a bit before you flip your, your, your standby. The standby basically lets, it, it, it almost kind of puts the brake on all the current that wants to just rush through the amp immediately. You know, so if it's trying to draw all this power in by you just, you know, flipping them on at, at the same time, you have more of this kind of unchecked electricity flowing through all the parts of the amp at once when your tubes aren't warmed up to the point where they're able to kind of uh, facilitate that. So, so usually, you know, you flip the power, flip the power switch on. I, I find that, you know, if you wait, you know, 30 seconds to a minute or two, you know, j j just give it some time to warm up uh, before you go and flip your, your standby. When you turn them off, it, it really doesn't matter. You can flip them both off at the same time. Should be fine. But yeah, definitely very important that before you even go to turn your tube amp on, make sure it's connected to a speaker load. Uh, otherwise, you might blow up your amp, and that's never a fun thing to deal with. So, yeah, no, that's that's great. So let's see what we got uh, next. Oh yeah, I didn't really, I kind of didn't really cover the the preamp tubes a bit there. They, your 12 AX7, your 12 AT7, um, very uh, you know very typical. Most tube amps are going to take you know one one or one or um, it, one or the other of these, I should say, and there's usually three, sometimes there's four. You know, if you have really high gain, metally kind of amps that have multiple channels, you may find more uh, preamp tubes in there. And again, like I was saying, they are, um, they're the ones that are gonna go first if there are any that are going to, uh, you know, kind of fry first. They're also made by the tens of thousands upon tens of thousands. So sometimes you might just get a bum tube uh, and that definitely does happen. If that ever happens, though, you know, I, I, uh, if you're unsure, I wouldn't go, you know, poking around in your amp if you're if you're not sure. Um, you do have to be careful about that, especially if you have the whole chassis out. You know, um, you can get uh, some pretty hefty shocks if if your amp is plugged in and you're kind of wrenching around in there. So don't. I wouldn't advise doing that. Bring it into your local professional if you have a shop, if or if you have an amp guy, if you have a guy that you take electronic stuff to. Um, definitely, I advise going to that. Uh, first, if you if you can, if you run into any any issues, so let's let's move on here. So, uh, any more questions in terms? Oh, I think we got one. Uh, let's see, uh, uh, Jose. Okay, yeah. So so Jose saying, do I need to t uh, to keep turning it on if I don't use it frequently? I have heard it is good for the amp and and the components to regularly run current through. If you don't turn it on uh, often enough, um, you know, and maybe somebody else can chime in here to. Uh, uh, to confirm this, um, but I, I have heard, you know, you put it, if you're not using it at all, it's good to flip it on like once a month and leave it running for a little bit, um, just so, you, just so the, a bunch of those parts don't uh, wear out, because um, there are definitely parts in tube amps that, that will need to be changed, you know, over, the, over the, uh, the, the, the term of its life, you know, every part has a, has a limited shelf life, you know, some are 10 years, some are 40 years, it, it, it depends, but always something to keep an eye on for sure. Uh, let's see. So, do we have do we have any more questions there regarding that? So, okay, let, let's keep going. Let's keep going, guys. So, um, we're looking at tube amps pros and cons now. Kind of get made a little list to see what we what we think. So, pros for the tube amp that warm natural sound uh, that that everybody loves. You know, um, it, them being very touch sensitive, very reactive to your playing is a plus. It really it really helps you. Um, gauge your own dynamics and your own, uh, you, you know, your own playing ability. It really helps to to teach you. Some, you know, I would say that they're not as they're not as forgiving. So if you're um, if you're working on you know scales and you want to play some stuff fast, there is no lie that's going to come from a, a, a tube amp. They're going to amplify exactly what's coming on. Sometimes you don't have a lot of gain to kind of hide behind. So they're very they're very touch sensitive, very reactive, very good 
um, I, I think just a good thing all around. So um, the next one, um, they really are the benchmark for guitar tone around the world. They, the tube amp is the highest standard um, that people are comparing it to. Uh, and there's been a lot to kind of try and recreate the sound of a tube amp, which we're going to uh, go into in just a sec. But um, it really is, you know, uh, it, it's what every guitar sound is judged by nowadays, uh, is that tube amp sound. It's been around forever. It's, it's funny to think that something that is, you know, that was made out of necessity for, for sheer volume has, has, uh, has developed into something as n necessary, you know, in today's, in today's uh, music world. Um, they, uh, it's such an old technology. You basically have these little light bulbs that are, that are giving you all these tones. And it's such a, it's such a weird thing to think of in, in such a digital age, but there's still a place for, for uh, such an old design, so to speak. So very cool. Um, some cons of tube amps, they do require more maintenance. Uh, and tubes in general are just less reliable as we kind of touch on it. They're made of glass, they're, they are delicate. Um, you do have to be careful when you're transporting your amp. You know, you can't just like huck it into a room because uh, you might break your tubes and that's, and that's not good. Um, they also, the tubes do fail. It is a, it is a point where you do have to watch it. Again, like, like the earlier questions, you know, how often should I change them? Well, if you haven't changed them in, in five, six, seven years and you're thinking about playing regularly, it's probably time to change them just for the sake of the reliability. So they definitely are less reliable uh, than some other options nowadays. Um, tube amps can also be, another con for them is they can be more expensive. Uh, th there is a pretty wide range nowadays. Uh, I would say, you know, to get an entry level tube amp is, is probably around, uh, you know, maybe the five to six hundred dollar mark, depending on where you go. Uh, and then it just goes up from there. There are some boutique builders that charge, you know, sometimes up to $10,000 for an amp. It's, it, you know, for it being hand built and all that. Um, and there is a market for that, but they, uh, a lot of the really sought after uh, sounds and amps, um, if you want to buy that amp, they're, they're not necessarily cheap. They're harder to pick up on a lower budget, unless you get a wicked deal on a used one, which uh, I would definitely look around for, you know. Um, I guess kind of the last con that we have here for tubes, they, they are heavy. They are very heavy. Uh, the power transformers in them are a lot bigger. They're these big hulking things. You have, you know, um, in this instance, you would have, uh, this is a combo here, so you also have a speaker in, in it as well. Uh, so that, that combination of things, tube amps can be very heavy. I think, uh, you know, we've all had the experience of having to lug either ours or a friend of ours that we know they have this, th this giant tube head and you have to lug it up the stairs and you're like, why does this thing weigh 80 pounds? This is crazy. So they are very heavy and, and can be harder to, to, to bring around. So if you're touring or if you, you know, are just going over for a jam, you might, a lot of people nowadays are kind of opting for something that is, uh, more lightweight and, and easier to carry. So that is, you know, uh, going to be a downside. So any other questions on tube amps before we move along? Because uh, we're going to go on to solid state amps next. Uh, we can also touch on stuff as we go. If you have questions, please fire them in and, and we'll, we'll do our best to get you here. So uh, tubeless amp. Yeah, so, so actually, so Jeff, Jeff asks um, that he has, uh, he says, I have a PV wrapped, or, or, or sorry, a PV Bandit 112 tubeless amp. What's your thoughts on tubeless amps? That's exactly what we're going to go into. So in the first, uh, in, this is basically going to be a two-parter because there are two different, uh, you know, two different options that we, that we can look at this now. So, so stay tuned, Jeff. We are going to cover all of that uh, coming up here. So, um, Looking at solid state amps, uh, what is a solid state amp? They use electronic transistors instead of glass tubes. So similar thing, you know, there's a circuit board in there that makes your sound. They're just not using glass tubes anymore. Um, they generally don't distort when you turn the amp up really loud. So unlike tube amps where, you know, you turn them up loud enough, you get this natural kind of distortion out of them. Solid state amps don't don't necessarily give you that option. The, uh, if anything, they really are designed to sound good at, at some lower volumes if you're trying to get some gain. Um, but uh, you know, on the flip side of that, they are great for players who want maximum headroom. You know, if, you want, if, you're a, if you're a jazz player, uh, you, know, you want that loud 
clean, undistorted amp. You don't want anything, you know, getting in the way. You don't want anything naturally distorting or clipping. You want that to be super loud, super clean. Uh, and you can see there on the slide, um, that, that's a picture of a Roland Jazz Chorus. It's been around forever. They still make them. Uh, one of the kind of jazz guitarist go-tos for, uh, for a solid state amp. And there's so many options out there now. Uh, tons of companies that are offering solid state amps. Um, some, uh, some, uh, most of them having multiple channels on them, having like a clean and a dirty channel to give you those options. Uh, but generally solid state, I, I would say, is more, can be more favored by jazz players, bass and keyboard players. I know we had Dan in here last week and he was talking about bass amps and all that. And they, uh, uh, having a solid state bass amp is, is huge for them um, because that's a, that's a great example of not wanting your, your, uh, your tone to distort when you play it. You just want to have this fat, clean, straightforward tone. So. Um, another thing with solid, uh, solid state amps is that um, a lot of them will give you some built-in effects. Maybe not a ton, but they'll give you a couple, you know, you know, it'll have reverb, may have chorus, may have a delay, you know, like an echo effect, just to give you a little bit, um, uh, you know, a little bit of flavor that you can, that you can put in there. Uh, you know, and I, and I will say that there are, I think the primary the primary kind of customer base for solid state amps at this point in time with the way things are going it seemed to be geared towards more of a more of a beginner level uh, 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 spot because they are definitely more affordable to make they're generally very small they're really great practice amps because they can be small they can be quiet a lot of them will give you uh, a headphone option. You can plug headphones in if you want to be uh, if you want to be silent. That is one thing that I, I, I may have forgotten to touch on for tube amps. Is most tu uh, most tube amps do not give you a headphone uh, a headphone input. Uh, it's just something to do with the, te the technology. You generally need a separate kind of load box, uh, much like what we've got here, the Universal Audio uh, Aux that we have hooked up over here, which you'll hear that a bit later. But this, you know, you would need a load box that allows you to plug some headphones in. So solid state amps are, are really great for that. They do give you a headphone in if you have to be, if you have to be quiet, if you don't want to bother anyone. A Couple of popular solid state amps that we got here, the Roland Jazz Chorus that I talked about earlier, the uh, Fender FG or Champion series. I know they've even just come out with the Champion XL, which gives you quite a few effect options. Uh, which is nice. Again, that headphone option is great. A couple of channels, you know, like a clean and a dedicated dirty sound as well. So you can switch between the two. So it makes it a little more versatile. A um, little fun fact, John Fogarty used these amps called custom amps. If, you've, if you ever look at old uh, pictures of, you know, CCR or John Fogarty on stage, you'll see these, these like leather padded amps on stage, some are blue, some are purple, you know, it looks like a piece of furniture and the end, and, and he kind of preferred that, that solid state sound. Even, um, even the Beatles back in the day, you know, when Vox kind of first came out with their, their version of solid state stuff, they threw it at the Beatles. They're like, here guys, go play this stuff. Cause you're huge. And, and those solid state Vox amps are, are worth, worth quite a lot of money nowadays, I think. So you know, it's funny how that goes. I, I say that solid state nowadays really is kind of a, a more entry level point in there, and, and that is true. But there were definitely uh, some some points in time where solid state was the thing, like the 80s, uh, especially in the 80s. Uh, people really were tired of their tube amps breaking down, tired of always having to be careful with them. The tubes would blow up, they would get old, they'd have to do all this maintenance, and they were like, why do we want to do that? There's this amp that will never break you know, unless you throw it out a window or something like that. But uh, that was kind of where that all came from. They're like, we want something that's going to be reliable, that we can take around. Um, another big plus is that they are very, they're very lightweight. Uh, you don't have those massive transformers like you have in, in tube amps. So they're, they're super easy to carry around. You can even get something that's a little bit bigger, you know, and depending on the speakers that you have in it, you know, that'll definitely, that'll always add some weight. But, but generally, you know, the cabinets that they're put in, uh, the power transformers in them are very, very shrunk down uh, and they're very easy uh, to, to move around. So uh, definitely, definitely a lot of pluses there. Um, some pros and cons of solid state stuff. Uh, like I just said, they're lightweight, they're easy to transport. They're, they tend to be very inexpensive. You don't have these 
hand-wired things that, that people you know, search after for, for N2 maps. You really just have an inexpensive way, they're made on an assembly line, they're just they're, they're put together and you turn them on and they'll go and you don't have to worry about, do I have bad tubes, you know, uh, is this going to break on me? You don't have that. Um, another pro, again, great for jazz players, great for bass players. If you're a jazzy guy out there, um, very easy to recommend a solid state amp to you. Depending on your flavor, it is always going to be about preference and what you like uh, and all that. So don't take this as me telling you, hey, every jazz player, like go buy, <laughs> go buy a solid state amp. But um, you know, we can make we can make all sorts of gear work for our tastes and our and our purposes. That's for sure. And it is always going to be up to your ears what you hear, what you like the sound of. That is that's always going to be the most important thing. You know, when you're when you're shopping for an amp. So. Um, let's move over to the cons. They can sound, solid state can sound a little brittle uh, or cold, especially if, if you're using um, some type of built-in distortion. Uh, they may not have the, the warmth uh, that, that, a, that a tube amp m might offer. You'll definitely get options for uh, you know, some really good heavy sounds, a lot of high gain uh, metal players like solid state amps because of the type of distortion you can get out of there. Um, so I'm not putting that down. That's uh, that's definitely a great option to have, but they can uh, they may not just sound as warm as a tube amp. Uh, another thing with solid state amps is you may again depending depending on where you jump into this whole rabbit hole adventure that is guitar amps, you may want to upgrade uh, or, or get something different down the road. Uh, I think every guitar player here can attest to getting their first guitar amp. Maybe it came with one of those packs where you get the guitar, the amp, and the bag and everything. It's a little, it's a little 10 watt thing. And it's your first step into the world of amps. Um, and if you really get into it and you really, uh, you know, you really delve into the world of guitar tone, you, you will likely want to upgrade that amp down the road. And there's nothing wrong with that. We all start at, at some, some place and, and where we end up is all, is all up to us. So. Um, and again, I, th I kind of already touched touch on the solid state amps. Generally don't sound like a tube. They don't sound like a tube amp. They have their own, their, their own unique sound. Um, they can be very loud, very clean, very punchy, but also could, again, like I said earlier, could be you know, kind of cold sounding. Not as, you know, not as uh, warm and squishy as a, as a tube amp may, may be. So um, they're not exactly, at least at this point, trying to be tube-like. They kind of are their own thing. But that will bring us into our next point, uh, which are digital and modeling amps. So a lot of the times digital and modeling amps uh, get lumped into the same category as a solid state amp, but they, they do function very, very differently. Uh, let's see what we have here. So, so Delta asks, um, are the load boxes the same? Is it beneficial to buy an inexpensive load box? Uh, is it just a register? So, no, I would say all load boxes generally aren't the same. I would say in terms of the features that they offer and maybe in terms of, of the sound. Uh, there are uh, a lot of options, especially recently, like I would say, I would say in the last couple of years, load boxes and attenuators, um, which we will cover that in a little bit, so I might save that for a little later because we are going to touch on this. We're going to talk all about uh, the aux and, and I can get into it a little more there, but um, you know what, yeah, De Delta, hang on to your question. We'll, we'll come back to that later because uh, it's definitely another kind of rabbit hole that we can go down and, and we'll, we'll touch on that, so for sure. Um, again, yeah, so digital and digital modeling amps versus solid state, uh, they, they often get bunched into the same category and they're really not the same. Digital amps use an intricate computer program to produce a, a ton of different tones and effects. They, their, um, their, their prime directive really is to give you as many uh, properly reproduced tones as you can to make you as versatile a, as you a, as as they possibly can. They're designed to replicate popular tube amps and tones, um, especially some maybe some of the more expensive amps. You know, uh, uh, we I feel like we've all been in a in a position where we look at a guitarist that we love. You look at like Slash, for example, and you see that he's got a big silver jubilee full stack there, and you go, man, like that. That rig is $10,000. How am I ever going to get to that point? How am I ever going to get that kind of sound? 
Uh, thankfully, a lot of great modeling amps nowadays have modeled some of the most popular amps out there. A lot of that stuff from Marshall, from Vox, from Fender, it really gives you all of that in, in, in one box. Uh, modeling technology really has kind of caught up in the last few years uh, to where it to where it was. Uh, they've really been able to replicate. They've been able to replicate a tube amp so well that uh, as if you have if you take five minutes and look around on the internet, you'll find a slew of videos of blindfold videos of, of people going between you know a, a modeling amp, modeling a particular amp, and then against the real thing. And I, I would say maybe more often than not, uh, you'd find that. People either don't hear a difference, barely hear a difference, and if they do hear a difference, it's it's almost too good to maybe complain about. Now there are going to be different levels of this. You know, thankfully now in in uh, in modeling amps, uh, you will find that there are tons of options available at most price points. A lot of great uh, even entry level amps. They'll have very small amps available. You know, in that sub two fifty to two hundred dollar range. Uh, and a lot of these amps will give you, uh, uh, a lot of them will have a menu kind of built in. So you basically have like a preset wheel so that you can just kind of scroll through and pick your sound. You know, someone's already gone to the trouble of, of putting together a lot of great sounding presets that sound like famous songs, famous artists, famous recordings. So the, the, the tones that we all love and want to have at our fingertips are basically in there now. You know, you don't really have to do much. Um, you just have to turn a knob, and you're basically there, and you're free to tweak it however you want. Uh, you know, some great, some great offerings uh, that we've got uh, are, you know, the Line Six Spider series. They've been around for years, and uh, and definitely with their more recent Mark II upgrade to the Spider Five, uh, some really choice sounds uh, coming out of those amps now, giving you all those effects, all those amps, really awesome. Um, you also have the Boss Katana, uh, which is. Probably one of the better selling digital amps that we've got going right now. I've got the the one uh, the 100 watt 1 by 12 here behind me that we're going to demo uh, in a bit after this. We're going to go through each of the amps and I'm going to give you a bit of a sample of what they are kind of sounding like. So um, you've also got the Fender Mustang series, which again, great, really nice display that they give you on that thing. You're able to see what amp you're using, what kind of effects you have. You can change all that stuff uh, on the fly or or uh, you know. Um, beforehand if you want to. So uh, they've also got, you know, for digital modeling, modeling the more professional level units as well. Uh, so they really do cover uh, this, this wide range of, of customer base. You know, what do you want? Are you a beginner? Are you more intermediate? Are you a gigging professional? Uh, for the higher end stuff, you have stuff like Kemper, the Kemper Profiler, the Headrush, you have Line 6 Helix, which has really been coming up in the ranks, it seems, uh, which are basically you know, computer programmed amp profiles that, that are designed to, to respond like a tube amp does, um, give you that same quality of tone that you're, that you're expecting at, uh, you know, in, in some cases a lower price point. But again, at that professional level, they really, like Kemper for example, they basically take a real amplifier, mic it up in a bunch of different ways, Change the settings up a bunch. I'm very, I'm generalizing, mind you. Um, you know, uh, someone else can go through the full in and out of a Kemper if they want. But uh, they're basically miking it in any possible way that they want. You know, to be able to to accurately reproduce it as if it was a real amp, which is crazy to think of. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so uh, what is so Bruce says? So would the Hughes and Kettner Tube Meister series be a mix of tube and modeling? In some, in, yeah, I would say, I mean, they are tube amps. They also do have a bunch of digital effects uh, that, are, that are built into them as well. So pretty easy to stick, you know, if you want to give uh, a tube amp player an option for some effects, some chorus, some delay, some of that, they will have. It's pretty easy to put in like a little computer chip in there in, in a dedicated effects section. So yeah, I'd say, th I'd say they're great for that. Um, the, two, uh, the Tube Meister series, Hughes and Kettner has also been really great at incorporating their own kind of emulated out for their load box so you can just plug one of their heads, you know, directly into your recording system. So I yeah, I think I think that's a great example. That's that's a great example. Um and maybe on another thing I didn't really touch is you, is you do have these kind of hybrid amps. Uh, I don't feel they're as popular as they are now. I feel digital has really kind of replaced these, but they they were these hybrid amps 
Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, actually, Bobby, you, you got here um, exactly what I was about to talk about. What are my thoughts on the line six Bogner combo? So, yeah, yeah, yeah uh, similar, similar thing. You know, it really integrating you know tubes into like a solid state or digital platform. Like again, these kind of hybrid things. I feel it was a necessary stepping stone. Um, I haven't personally spent a lot of time with the with the line six Bogner combo. I know we had uh, one or two in the store uh, for a little bit. It, it was in that strange, again, that strange in-between period where you had this really sophisticated sounding amp that used tubes but also used a bit of, you know, solid state and digital um, modeling and, what, and whatnot in there to give you a wide range of sounds. But at the same time, you got all the weight of a tube amp. So you pick up one of those combos and they were super heavy, if I remember. Uh, you know, so I, I, they they don't make them anymore, and I feel that I feel they have they're in a, a place now where digital modeling amps, like standalone digital amps, uh, just do it better than anything they had before. They're, they're good enough now where they almost don't need to incorporate that 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 tube uh, function again. Like around that same time, you would find amps that had a complete solid state power section, but then had one 12 ax7, like one preamp tube, so that the gain that you got. Uh, was like real tube gain, real tube saturation, which did, I, I think, did uh, a, a good job of it. They even had a slew of pedals uh, uh, for the time there too, where they were putting a 12AX7 in it to give you that natural kind of tube overdrive, which I thought, I think was a great feature. But, but again, now I think just with the way digital stuff works and how good they've got it, they don't have to do that anymore. You know, and, and it's one less, again, it's one less thing where you have to change a tube over time. So. Uh, they, um, digital stuff is just, has come so far where you really, you really almost, the question is, do I need to buy a tube amp anymore? And, uh, and my answer to that, I think is really, it's, it's, it's up to you. Modeling has given us the, the, the means to be as versatile as we can in a studio and a live, uh, you know, function. Um, especially, you know, I'm just going to this next slide here. Uh, software amps, you know, um, software amps are are huge now. You know, stuff from from Universal Audio, Axe Effects, Guitar Rig, basically being uh, b basically giving us those those amazing sounds at our desk. You know, at our at our uh, studio thing. Uh, let's see here. What was Patrick saying? Uh, with a Trainer Custom 50 Special, do I need to unplug the speaker or change the ohms to use the direct out? Uh, I will. I will be getting to that, uh, Patrick. I, yeah, I will be. I will be getting to that. So let's let's save that for a bit later because we're going to talk about loads and cabinets and all that stuff in, in a little bit. So Patrick, put a pin in that. We'll we'll talk about that in a second here. Um, again, back to uh, you know some more digital modeling stuff. They. What they give you in, you know, for the cost now is insane. They, they almost, you know, they're, they're almost able to, li uh, to, to eliminate external effects, to uh, eliminate cabinets almost, to eliminate um, any kind of physical rig that you may have to bring around. So it's, it's pretty crazy. Okay, we got some more questions popping up here. Uh, so Bobby asks, would you say the quality difference uh, is significant between modeling uh, modeling an amp through a pedal like an ME25 uh, and modeling through the digital amp like the Spider. I think it depends on what you have plugged in because there are some different some differences in modeling that uh, that can kind of go into some different parts. Uh, because you, first you basically have the preamp part of it, the you know the the structure of the basic sound of the amp, but then you also have the speaker emulation, the the uh, you know the the cabinet, the speaker, the the microphone. What are they trying to convey that sound through? You know, so one may argue, you know, you can run an ME25 or an ME80 uh, through a basic guitar amp, just set it on clean and use that. Uh, whereas whereas, or you can just use a digital amp, just like just Bobby, just like you're asking. I think it depends on if you like how that speaker sounds, if you like how that I, I really think a lot of that preference comes out of um, whether or not you like the sound of the speaker, of the sound that you actually hear coming out of your speaker or your, um, uh, it coming out of your speaker or your cabinet or something like that, because that has such a huge part of your tone 
uh, that I think if you were to just run it direct, it would be different if you were to just run like the ME25 or ME80 direct into a system and you were li like, are you listening to it on studio monitors? Are you listening to it with headphones? Are you listening to it in a room? I, I really think it's, I really think it's definitely up to a preference at, at that point. At least if you have a separate effect unit, you can turn it on and off. And I think it might integrate better if you have another amp that you do really enjoy using, but maybe it doesn't give you the particular sound you want, you know? Say you're using like a Vox and it's very chimey and very, um, you know, very bright sounding, but you want like a heavier, you know, a sound from maybe a Marshall or like a Mesa or something like that. Like that Vox m maybe isn't going to give it to you. So if you uh, go to their preset and use that with your amp, I think that just makes it more versatile. Um, Quality difference, I think the effects and, and all that in there, I think are going to be very similar quality. Um, and again, like the Spider 5, uh, I know that they've done a, a, a software update recently where everything I think just got like a 10 times better. It just, it's constantly getting better. Uh, it, it, it's kind of scary. Digital and modeling technology is getting so good that it's, at the end of the day, I think a lot of this is really going to come down to, do you like the sound of it? Does it get you the sound that you want? Does this does this suit my purpose? And if the answer is yes, then, then, then you go with that. And that can go for any of these. That can go for a tube, solid state, or a digital amp. If you like the sound of it and it does what you need it to do, like, I, I feel we all should trust our ears a little bit more because that's really going to be the deciding factor. I will say, though, on that note, Bob, and, and if anyone else has this question, older modeling stuff uh, it tends to maybe not be not sound as good. Again, it's just it's technology. It starts in one place, and they are constantly, constantly improving it. Where it is now, I think it's it's kind of laughable about how good it is. But um, but if if you were to get an older modeling unit, for example, maybe one that's ten years old, I think you might find that the quality of the effects and the amps in there maybe isn't as good as what you might expect. So. If you're going to go the digital route, I, I would probably recommend to go as current as you possibly can because you're probably going to get the best sound that way. Uh, Jose, what, what are we saying here, Jose? Can you comment about using these multi-effects with two amps, like a Helix and a, and a Mesa Boogie? Okay. Yeah. I think, uh, and, and again, this is my personal, uh, my personal opinion, is that you know, if you have a full-blown Helix board, that thing is designed to model different amps and speakers off the bat. That I th feel that's almost half of its directive. Um, now, if you're asking about their effects, like Helix, for example, has a standalone effects unit that you can use. So if you like the sound of your amp and you have a good amp or a good tube amp, but you want a bunch of effects, I would opt for maybe just the, the standalone effects unit because if you're not going to be using you know, any of the amp modeling in it, I, I almost wonder if it's worth it. But uh, not to say that you can't, I just, I just wonder if it's um, gratuitous at that point. Uh, definitely in those units they have some great, uh, some great presets and some great effects in there that, that will either react very well with your tube amp or, or may not. I think it depends on how you run it. Um, and that is something definitely uh, to keep in mind, especially with tube amps, is that they, because they're so reactive, different effects uh, and if you're running like a, like a uh, you know a Helix or something like that with it, it is going to respond differently depending on what your effects or your amp sim is set as versus what your your front panel controls are set as. Like if you have the gain higher, you're going to get more natural you know compression uh, and maybe a little more sustain if your gain is a little higher versus if you just run it straight clean. Um, it also may color the sound of the, the pedal unit that you're using as well. I think it depends on what, you, what you're going for. You may like that different colorization. I just wonder if, you know, if you're gonna go spend you know, $2,000 on a Helix, uh, but you have a really good amp at home, I think I, I would question what, your, uh, what you wanna use more, what your, what your end goal is to get out of it. Because uh, I think that's really gonna make, uh, make or break. Um, it'll also give you the option though, like if you don't have to get rid of your amp and you want to go Helix for a bit, I mean like people do that all the time. People will get rid of all their effects and all their amps and stuff like that and get a standalone, you know, digital unit. And then maybe over time, maybe your taste change and maybe you want to go back to a more analog version and then you have to rebuy your amp. So I mean, uh, I would make sure that you know what you'd like, uh, you know, before you make a any type of decision like that. Uh, Luckily, you can go to any local Long McQuaid and try the stuff out, try the combination of them, and, and see what you like. So, 
Uh, let's see, George, uh, if digital amps, uh, if digital amp models match tube amps so perfectly, what's the value of buying a tube amp these days? That is the question, isn't it? <laughs> that really, that, that is the question. Is it really worth it? Is it, some people are more digital, some people are more hardware uh, based guys, analog guys. Like I, I will never lose a place in my heart for a good old fashioned tube amp. I love, you know, seeing a half stack or a full stack because I think that, I think that that's awesome. And I think it will come down to, do you care about having the real thing? And if the answer is no, then, then no. Um, but there will also, there will always be super gear related people. I'm definitely a gear nut. I, I love amps. Uh, and, and having a physical thing, I, I think it's just about, you know, having that physical thing with you. I, I could honestly say that if I had, you know, if I had a digital comparison to the real thing next to me, and if I did one of these blindfold tests and I'd be like, yeah, they sound the same. I'm not going to argue with that. I'm not going to be like, oh, well, the, the tube amp is still better because it's tube. It's, uh, do they both, do they sound good? Do they sound good? Do they work for what I need it to work for? And then, and then you make your decision from there. It's, it's always going to be a, a preference thing, a personal choice if someone wants uh, to forgo an actual tube amp. You know what I mean? So let's, uh, let's keep things moving here, guys. Uh, we'll go to some pros and cons, which we've probably covered most of these, um, you know, digital and uh, digital modeling amps, very lightweight, very portable. They're very versatile. Uh, and they can also eliminate the need for an amp or some external effects. Uh, some cons, uh, sometimes they can be very complex to use. They might take a, a bunch of menu diving, you know, to kind of suss out the sound that you want. Depends on how much patience you have for the learning curve of the unit. So, um, I, and I, as I already touched on, older modelers generally just don't sound as good as the new ones. Um, if you're using studio, modeler, mo uh, studio modelers, you know, strictly within the use of your computer, uh, you know, you could be limited by the need of that computer. So if you get rid of all your physical hardware and you're just using stuff on your computer, you might be a little limited on what you can do with that stuff. So, um, so before we move on to wattage and power, um, I'm actually going to now give you guys a bit of a sound sample. Uh, what I tried to do, I, uh, I tried to get us a, a bass tone out of all three of those amps, um, starting with the Marshall, getting a good kind of crunch sound, and then trying to kind of mimic that as best I could through the other amps, just so we kind of have a level uh, playing field of, uh, of all of them. So we're going to start here with the, with the JCM 800 combo. Uh, and right now, uh, we are using, uh, we, we have the combo mic'd up here. As you can see, we're actually not using uh, the, aux, the aux box yet. Uh, for the cabinet modeling, we will be using that later. So right now, you're going to hear all three amps mic'd up with SM57s. Uh, and we'll see how they sound. So as you can see there, I tried to demo, you know, you, you can basically just roll back on your guitar's volume knob to clean up the amp just to show the responsiveness of it. Uh, so again, I'll give you a, a, another just quick little banger here before I move on to, we're going to go to the orange uh, crush next that, that's behind me. So, here, so here's the 800 one more time. <laughs> Okay, so now let's take a little trip over here. Now here's the uh, here's the orange, the, uh, the the crush twenty over here. So. <laughs> Thank you. 
So now, I, if you could hear there, you know, when I tried to roll down on the orange, the orange is the solid state amp, by the way. Um, you could hear that, you know, it did clean up a little, but it also got like a little, a little muddy, sort of. Like it didn't have as much clarity there. Um, also didn't really have as much sponginess, but uh, you know, the gain level was there. Uh, so that's a, good, that's a good little shot. I'll give you one more little shot of the orange and then we'll move on to the katana next. So here's the orange. Okay, now let's switch over to the, uh, the katana here. Okay, so now this is the Katana 100. Uh, it's set on the 50 watt mode as well. It does have some different power levels here, but uh, just to keep it kind of a little more in line with the lower wattage amps we got going on. So here's the Katana. <laughs> Okay, so hopefully that gave you, you know, a little bit of a, an insight on, on how they sound. Um, you know, if we want to go back to that, we can do that a little bit more after. But I tried to get, you know, a similar kind of ballpark tone uh, that we got there uh, for all of them. So I'm just going to toss this down here. So let's see. So what is so Michael? Michael saying when you mic an amp, does the mic touch the touch the grill all the time, or does it depend on the amp? How's it mic? Uh, you know, that is a whole. A whole nother thing uh, to touch on. It, it really is, um, there's a lot of different things that you can delve into uh, trying to record, uh, record an amp. Like right now, uh, all of these are basically like, you know, maybe a quarter inch off the grill cloth. You know, depending on how close or far you put it, it's going to change the low end response. Uh, and that really definitely just comes down to how you want to record it, what kind of tone uh, you're going for when you want to record it. So. You know, there are certain, you know, certain ways to record it where you can have room mics, close mic'd, a little bit further back. It's all about just how it captures. At, at this point, we're just, we're just close miking them just to give you a good sample. So um, definitely something that, uh, you know, can be covered uh, uh, down the road. Um, you know, like uh, in a few weeks, we definitely have, uh, we've got Danny Underwood from Boss, who's going to be doing a whole thing on how to record your guitar at home, whether that's silently or whatnot. Uh, we don't have a date for it yet, but... Uh, definitely stay tuned for that, okay? So let's talk about wattage and power. And if you're very special, um, some amps even go to 11. So let's go here. So wattage, wattage is basically going to dictate how loud your amp is. Uh, whether it's 1 watt or 100 watts, uh, it, it really is kind of the first question that we ask with, you know, how loud is this amp? How powerful is it? Can I... Can I play on stage with it? That kind of question. Now, um, there is a difference between volume when we're talking about wattage versus tube and solid state. Tube amps um, are louder than solid state amps. About 10 to 15 watts, 15 is probably the more likely, uh, are about as loud as 50 watts solid state, state. And that just comes down to the different types of, of, of power uh, transformers and, and amplification that's actually in the amp. Uh, you know, so even though your solid state amp may be like 50 watts, uh, it will be basically drowned out if you put it head to head with a with like a 15 or so uh, watt tube amp. So that is definitely something to consider. Um, 15 watt. Whenever we talk about wattage in like a live sense, you know, if you're playing with a band, we're talking about general loudness. Um, again, it kind of comes back to the the tube amp as just being on top as the reference point. We we, we are usually talking about tube wattage uh, it, for the comparison. So um, so 15 watts is 
kind of the, the accepted minimum for wanting to play on stage uh, with a band, and that's yeah, 15 watt tube amp. Uh, if you had a 15 watt solid state amp, I'm sure all of us have had an experience with like a little 15 watt bass amp, for example. That 15 watt bass amp is not going to keep up with your drummer. And that really, that really is the question, it, it, is, is will it, how loud is your drummer? That's, that's kind of what dictates your, your need for wattage, 15, 20, 30 watts. Does your drummer hit hard or does he play kind of soft? And I think that's going to be, that's kind of the, the, the ballpark range uh, for that. Um, now we have, you know, do I what do I choose? Do, do, there are low wattage versus high wattage amps, you know, so what, what's the difference? Why would I choose one over the other? People have been opting for lower wattage stuff for the last little while now. Um, it seems we're all in this, uh, we're all in this place where it's, it's hard to make noise or, uh, you know, us as, as Canadians, we're so nice that we don't want to bother, you know, our neighbor. Uh, but then other, you know, some people also don't care. <laughs> so, um, but, but lower wattage amps are really becoming a huge thing so that you can have a full natural tube sound at lower volumes. That's something that's a lot more manageable to record. Generally, if they're lower wattage, it also may mean they are more, they're more compact uh, as well. So they're easier to carry around. You get them in, you know, smaller combos like this. There's even small head and cab options too. And, and uh, actually, um, Matt, if you could pan over here, we, we can see the, the dark horse that we have here, the head and the cab. That's just like a, like a 112, 15 watt head. Uh, and it definitely, you know, um, that, that thing will definitely keep up at, at, at most gigs, uh, you know, at, at uh, today's standards. So, you know, do I choose low wattage or high wattage? I think, it, I think it's always going to come back to, you know, what, what's your preference. If you have a higher wattage amp, it usually means, uh, like we talked about earlier, that there is more headroom in that amp. Higher wattage amps allow for a louder, cleaner signal. Um, it also usually means that they are bigger and heavier and harder to, uh, to wheel around. You know, think of, uh, uh, think of back in the day when you, when you go to a stadium show and they just have 30 massive tube amps all, all on that stage like that. They, those were high wattage stuff. They had to push air. They were needed to be heard. It's not really, you know, not so much anymore, it seems. It seems we don't even really need that. Like this, um, actually, you know, a really good uh, option here um, this JCM 800 has a 5 watt and a 20 watt setting, and and what you heard earlier, we were playing it on the 20 watt. So why don't I why don't I give you a sample here, and we'll switch it down to the 5 watt mode, and hopefully you can uh, you can hear a difference uh, of what we got going on here. So so here's the 20 watt. Try again. We okay there, Matt? <laughs> no, I, I did not I did not move it over. That that's so funny. Okay. So that I need to get myself an amp switcher. See, this is where the 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 rabbit hole for amp gear can go. This is kind of crazy. That's so funny. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Let's try that again. I was like, why can't I hear it? Yeah, no, this is okay. There we go. So that was the katana. That's so funny. See, yeah, the katana sounds good, doesn't it? Like I didn't even really like bat an eye. That's funny. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so if you heard that, it, it's not as um, uh, it is noticeable, but 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 it's not even the it's not the biggest difference really. Like when I went down to the five watt mode, it's it, it got it to me. You know, it was it was a bit quieter here in the room, and I hope that's coming across uh, to you guys. But not not so much quieter that it that it warrants like that it's like half you know half the volume it's not like 5 watts is is going to totally save you versus the 20 watts but the but the 5 watt version definitely is a little squishier it definitely compresses a little bit more um, but it does give you you know if you are in a situation where you can still be a little loud like right now like the volume on the amp is about 2 
you know, and I would say it's probably at a low like jam volume. Like you would, you'd probably have to turn it up more if you had a drummer in the room. Uh, but definitely loud enough for somebody to another guitar player to jam with, or if you had a bass player, you know, you you could you could uh, muck about. But you will find uh, that those wattage differences uh, change when you're actually able to turn the guitar amp up. Because when you turn that when you turn that master volume up. Uh, even if even if it is an amp like this that does have a master volume, meaning that it has a, a something to control the overall loudness of the amp and has a separate control for your gain or or preamp as it as it says on on the amp there. So even with master volume amps, when you turn them up loud, they get more full, they get fatter, they get more saturated, and you're able to do that uh, more consistently. You're able to do that uh, easier, you know, without totally you know, wanting your landlords or uh, neighbors to disown you. Um, you can do that easier on a lower wattage setting. Uh, there is a point where when you're turning up the volume on a tube amp where it, it basically stops getting louder uh, and just gets more saturated. Uh, and when we, uh, I'll see if I can showcase that when we move over to our, our speaker and cabinet section and we'll use the aux a little bit for that. So that is still coming, uh, Delta, where, where uh, I still see your question there. We will get to that. Um, and then same thing with, uh, with Patrick, we'll still get to your, your question there. So wattages, uh, wattages are a funny thing, you know, um, people want, people want to be able to use these types of amps at home. And even, you know, even somebody who was buying one of these, you know, that's 20 watts, which isn't a ton, has a switchable five watts. Sometimes that five watts is still going to be loud and you might need an alternative solution to be able to use headphones or something with an amp, which is why, you know, if you go for anything solid state or digital, pretty much all of these give you a headphone option. So you can record, uh, you, you can record or listen or jam totally silently. Um, the solid state modeling amps are also really designed to sound good at quiet low volumes. Uh, it was a problem that you that you sometimes can't always get uh, can't always fix with a tube amp. Tube amps are always going to be a bit louder. So let's uh, let's move on here. So yeah, so I just covered a master volume, non-master volume. Here we go. So now now we're going to talk about attenuators, attenuators, load boxes. So Delta, here's your I, I guess your your answer. I would say that. Uh, it, it, basically, a power attenuator is something that you put between. It is a load box that you put between the amp, the amplifier section of the amp, and and, and put it between the speaker. So it goes amp, output from the speaker, or output from the amp, sorry, into the load box, and then into the speaker, and that basically allows you to turn the amp up, nice and loud, but cut the volume down before it goes to the speaker. And there are absolute uh, differences between some, some lower end ones and some uh, more professional level ones. Uh, the best ones I would say to go for are what, what are called reactive load, uh, load boxes or attenuators. The reactive load, uh, as simple as I can maybe describe it, is, is it reacts similarly electronically to, to a speaker. So the amp feels like as if it's connected directly to the speaker. It doesn't feel as if there's something in between, uh, which does give it a bit more responsiveness and generally a better sound. Thankfully, you know, the world of attenuators has, has come a long way in the last couple of years. There's some really great ones you can buy. Um, there's even, a, I'd say, probably one of the better lower end options. I, I think one's made by Bugera. I think it's called the PS1. It goes for $170 maybe. Uh, really great uh, little unit there um, and really is designed to make tube amps, however big or small, more studio and home use friendly. And I've been using them for, for years because I, I, like the, I like the big old school amps uh, and really they just aren't as practical anymore. So you have units like this that, that actually give you those options. Um, I think the more I, I think with the, maybe the exception of that Bugera, I think there are, uh, I think there is more of a benefit to investing in a, in a more expensive load box. It really depends on what your budget is. You know, I'm not trying to say you have to spend a lot of money to get a good one, but I feel you have more better options in the higher price brackets. Uh, and, and it really comes down to what they do. Like uh, there are some where its its job is to just turn the volume down, and they don't give you any other features. Some don't even give you like a line out 
or anything like that. It'll just be head, uh, power attenuator, cabinet, and, and then that's it. And its sole job is to turn it down. In, in a unit like the UA Aux here, this thing is actually loaded with uh, a, lot of, a lot of great software from Universal Audio in terms of cabinet, speaker, and mic emulation. They even emulate the room. So you're able to have uh, studio level quality uh, recordings by just going into this box. They also give you a headphone out. Again, it seems like such a trivial little thing, but being able to use a, a, a tube amp with, with headphones and have it sound good, that's, that's the debate. Um, anything that has a line out, uh, and I think Patrick, this may, uh, uh, this may start to answer your question a little bit. Um, actually, actually, no, it, it, we're, we're, we'll still come back to you, Patrick. It'll, um, this was somebody's question earlier, is that like, uh, when you use a line out, you basically want it to be emulated. You want an emulated line out so that it sound it will sound as if it's connected to an amp or or, or uh, it'll it'll be connected to a speaker cabinet, sorry. If it doesn't, the the direct signal out is just a signal from the amp. It's not going through your speaker. You you're only getting half the sound and it's kind of unprocessed and can sound fizzy. Um, it may not sound uh, it may not really sound as good. So when you have something that's able to give you an emulated out, um, and that's why I love uh, this unit so much is that you can program different cabinet extensions, different studio level quality stuff that you can just, that you can hear with headphones, with your studio monitors. You can basically silently record uh, or jam with a tube amp now, which you, you really couldn't, you really couldn't do maybe even five years ago. You know what I mean? Um, now, uh, now, Patrick, let's see if I can answer your question here. So, with a Trainer Custom 50 Special, do I need to unplug the speaker or change the ohms to use the direct out? Uh, that is, yeah, no. Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, no, when you use the direct out, I think it just, I think it will just cut, would cut the speaker out. Um, I'd have to double check on that. Um, some amps, some amps uh, won't cut the uh, it won't cut the actual internal speaker. Some will. Like I know that the bass breaker will do that if you use the direct out. There's actually a switch. Uh, yeah, it actually, yeah, um, it, it should have a speaker defeat button. So um, I think a lot of those options nowadays will have that so that you can cut the incoming speaker. Generally, you don't have to change the the ohmage, uh, the, the the resistance uh, on on the amp for that, that should be fine. We'll talk more about uh, resistance and ohmage in a bit too, because we're gonna go on to, you know, some uh, speaker cabinets and stuff in a bit, so. Um, now, uh, you know, kind of back to our wattage thing. Uh, again, this whole thing with, with amplifiers, depending on how powerful your, your amp is, or how loud it is, a load box like that can be huge uh, to be able to make it uh, more usable. Um, you know, and, and there's a different, different range of prices for those products. But I think it's worth it if you like a classic, you know, physical amp. If you are like an amp guy, a tube amp person, like somebody that really enjoys the analogness and the hardware of having an amp, most of us aren't in a position to be able to use them to their full potential. We don't, we don't all, you know, live out in the boonies and 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 have infinite property to just let her let her go. As much as we'd all really like that, um, these are pretty revolutionary for being able to use those at home. Um, now, different wattages of amps uh, may require more speakers to handle the power, you know, that, and that's where uh, some different sized uh, speakers and whatnot come into play and where the question of head and cab versus a combo, you know, what should I go with, that's where a lot of this kind of comes up. So um, let's start with combos. Basically what we have here, everything we have here today is, is, is a combo and we have a, a little trainer dark horse over here that kind of you know, uh, has, has our head and cab bit covered. So uh, in a combo, the amp and the speaker are a part of the same box. They're in the same enclosure. You have your amp that's set here and then your speaker is generally down low and it's all contained in the same box. Combos are generally more portable and more typical for a practice amp. Now you can definitely argue that with with you know, um, like the trainer we have over here, with the there are a lot of small and lunchbox size heads and single speaker cabinets uh, that are available now that you can do that. Uh, but again, generally you have two hands to move that one for the head, one for the uh, one for the cab. If you get a combo, it's just it's all right there. You just you just take it with one hand and and you can go. Uh, combos can tend to have a bit of a boxier kind of sound or tone, uh, as you can see, like generally the combos are a bit smaller, they're a little more contained. Um, 
they can, uh, they're basically forcing a lot of that sound forward, uh, which can, um, which can lend itself to that that boxier kind of tone, um, and that you know, and that does depend on if it's if it's open back or closed back, uh, you know. So um, you have uh, some are closed back. Most larger cabinets you find are totally closed back, where the, where the, the entire back of it is fully sealed up and screwed down. When you have that, you have more low end response. You have uh, it's basically forcing all that air directly out the front versus if you have an open back where it is where you do have some air escaping at the back and it kind of fills the room a little bit you know if you have an open back combo or cabinet and, if, and it's up against the wall you'll actually hear a bit uh, more of an even spread of the sound a little bit less low end maybe again what's better versus what you like that it that's the endless debate so um, so Steven asks uh, did you talk about amps with power scaling and the difference in sound between scaling versus attenuation versus master volume. G good question, good question. I, I did not touch on power scaling. There are, uh, maybe a little bit, I, I mean, because this, this one, uh, you know, definitely, definitely has it. You know, this one's got a 20 and a 5 watt setting. Some even have, you know, like a full power, half power, some off you. Like Hughes and Kettner is really well known for having your 1 watt, 5, 10, 20, you know, and up. Um, and I suppose, there's always going to be tonal differences, like especially if you're, you know, talking power scaling versus attenuation, because attenuation is taking all of that signal and basically cutting the volume down before it gets to the speaker. So, so its reaction with the speaker is going to be a little different. Um, and with a master volume, um, master volume, you're you're kind of getting, you're, you know, if I'm on the the 20 watt setting for this amp, for example, and I have the volume turned down to like one it's not going to sound as full as if I'm on, you know, one or two on the lower wattage setting because we're not utilizing all that wattage, you know. So if you want the loudest, clearest kind of representation, you basically just, you just, you just turn the volume up and then that's how it sounds. There's always going to be a difference with how the amp reacts with the speaker versus what wattage it's set to versus um, what the volume is set to. Uh, it, there, there definitely is a difference. Uh, again, um, I would have to leave it up to the individual user to decide what they like best. You know, I, I really don't have the answer for what's best, but uh, what's cool is that you have all those options now. There, there was a point in time where you did not have that option. You know, people were taking old 100 watt tube amps. Uh, yeah, exactly. Steven, you just got it. I was just going there. Yeah, uh, on, on some, you, you know, if you'd have four EL34s in the back, you just take out two of them, and now you have an operational 50 watt amp. Um, and there are switches that, that just do that now and definitely a difference. Like if we're, if we're going to go with that example, uh, volume wise, and again, we're talking about tube wattage here. So 50 watts of tube power versus a hundred watts of tube power. The hundred watts is only about three dB louder than the 50 watt. So it's not really about cutting the volume down at that point, maybe a little bit, but not as much. It's more about how that amp reacts. You know, when you go from 100 to 50 watts, you lower that headroom, which gives you more natural compression and a bit more of a, maybe a focused kind of tone versus the full 100 watts is gonna, gonna give you a bit more of a, an open kind of sound. So not that doing that is going to change your volume a lot, but it's definitely gonna affect the sound more than anything. I'm just gonna have a little sip here, guys, pardon me. All right, there we go. Dan, you were a madman for doing this without drinking any water. I don't know how you did it. So, um, so what are we, let's see, what are we talking about here? So yes, yeah, so we were talking about open and closed back cabinets uh, for, for combos. Um, one little side effect that, 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 can, that can happen um, when you have a combo is, is sometimes you can develop a tube rattle, which in some is kind of inescapable. If you really think of this thing, you basically have the tubes that are hanging in the back and they're like, you know, that far away from the speaker. So depending on how loud you have the amp, there's a lot of vibration, a lot of air moving. The whole box is vibrating. So sometimes a little side effect is you, is you can kind of get this like, this kind of glassy little rattle, uh, really high, high pitch frequency thing happening. If you're recording, sometimes it can be a bit of a, a nightmare. It's uh, hard, to, hard to get rid of that sound. So, and sometimes replacing those tubes fixes it and others it, it may not. You may have to get some like tube dampers or something like that. You can get little bits of foam that you can put around them to kind of stop that. 
Um, and it doesn't happen with every combo, but I've seen it happen often enough where I'm kind of like, this, this is really, I think, can just be a byproduct. One of the benefits of doing, um, doing a head and cab is that it completely separates the amp and the tubes from the vibrating loud box uh, of the, of the, the cabinet. Um, so again, depending on, uh, depending on the, which way you want to go, it depends. I've definitely seen, we had a gentleman once who, uh, we had done three different tube swaps for a, a twin that he had, a big old Fender twin that just, that there's a big loud amp and we could not get rid of that tube rattle. It just, it, it just kept happening. Uh, it didn't matter what tubes we put into it. But then again, sometimes something like that will bother someone and other times it won't. It's just kind of the nature of the beast for combos sometimes. Um, and again, combos, very famous for allowing you with some lower wattage options like we were just talking about. So let's move on here. So now let's go to our head and cab section. So like I said, basically you have the head, the amp, the actual amplifier is separate from the speaker cabinet. Now, um, uh, a, a common misconception is people will call a speaker cabinet the, the amp. Uh, and it's uh, and it's, it's not the case. The amp is, act is actually what you plug into, what what provides you your tone and your sound, and they are just providing power and that signal to the speaker cabinet. So you have your amp and you have your speaker cab or cabinet. Um, when you connect these, and I'll see if I can show you here because we've got we've got this hooked up. I just want to see how long this cable is. So. Uh, so Matt, maybe if you want to zoom in a little bit here. So this is the back of the Dark Horse. It is plugged in using a speaker cable. And you can see that here. You can actually see the two kind of different wires. Uh, it does not look, uh, the end is also a little different from a patch cable. It usually has this kind of metal sleeve at the end. Now this cable's job is to carry electrical current, literal power from this amp and provide it to the cabinet. If you used a guitar patch cable, Bad news bears. Uh, eventually you'll probably melt the inside of that cable and you'll also potentially cause some damage to the rest of the amp. So we don't want that. I'm gonna put this back here. So speaker cable, very important. Um, I remember when I first bought my head and cab, I just bought a patch cable and then I was told very quickly to, no, don't buy the patch cable. Make sure you get a speaker cable. They are designed to handle that current and that power. So make sure that that's always plugged in. Uh, before you before you turn it on. Just going back to what we talked about at the beginning. So um, a benefit for head and cab, if you're going that route, it, it really does open up your, your options for being able to do different um, uh, amp and speaker combinations. So you may have a particular amp that is kind of your go-to, this amp does everything, I like this, and maybe you've got a bit of a cheaper speaker cabinet and you don't like how the, how the speakers sound, well, you can go out and you can change those speakers uh, or you can get a different size, whether it's bigger or smaller, and you can, use, you can still use that same amp. Um, there, uh, there may be this misconception out there that your head and your cabinet have to match, and I know Dan talked about this a little bit too on Thursday, that, you, uh, that is not the case. Uh, the, the, they do not have to be the same brand. They do not have to match. What is really important that should match are the, are, is the, uh, the ohms or the resistance. The resistance should, should match. Now, um, basically this just talks about the amount of power that is coming out of the amp and if the speaker cabinet is, is able to handle that, that amount of power um, or that amount of current uh, th that's coming through. So uh, it's usually best to make sure that those match. There are cases where you can mismatch them. Uh, it does change your sound a little bit. You know, one of the more popular bit is that if you have, you know, eight ohms coming out of the amp, you can plug it into a 16 ohm cab and, and you won't fry anything, it'll be fine. This is true. Uh, I don't think anyone's ever blown up an amp from going eight to 16. A good rule of thumb is that as long as the number on the amp, the ohmage on the amp, if the number is smaller than what is on the speaker cabinet, you should generally be okay to run to run those. Um, now, uh, now I will say again, the the best way to make sure that your amp is functioning as properly and uh, and as uh, uh, as properly as it can is to make sure that those match. So go eight and eight, go sixteen and sixteen. Most amps and cabinets nowadays are in that uh, for guitar anyway, usually in that eight or sixteen ohm um, category. 
So uh, usually in most, you know, we've all been in the in a case where you show up to a gig and you just want to bring your 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 head, and you know the other band has a cabinet going, and you may get there and realize that that they don't match. So you're like, oh, like what do I do? And you're like, oh well, and you plug it in anyway, and and then we hope that nothing blows up. So at least now, you know, it, it, if they match. Great, if not, make sure that number from the amp is smaller than the number on the speaker cabinet and generally you're going to be okay. Um, the cabinet should also have the uh, same or more wattage handling as the amp. So if you have a 50 watt amp, make sure that your speaker cabinet is at least 50 watts. Now, there are, now there's some talk and some debate about, um, about uh, the speaker cabinet should be twice what your what the output of your amp is and I think it really that kind of goes back to again the, the old tube amps you know you would have these amps that are rated for certain wattages whether they're 50 or 100 watts let's say that's what they were rated for uh, but like some Japanese cars uh, they actually produced more power than what they what they let on as you know some of these amps if you had a 100 watt amp what was putting out 110 120 uh, you know watts and so if you plugged a 100 watt head into a 100 watt handling cabinet, but your amp was actually making more power, then you'd blow up your speakers, which is, which is no good. So generally now I think they're more consistent and they're, and they're pretty good at keeping them within those operating parameters so you don't have to worry about that as much. Vintage stuff, it, totally I would probably go by that. Um, we don't always, and again this depends on if you're just diming the amp all the way or not. You know, Again, another handy thing with like a speaker a uh, load box or something like that can really, uh, you know, just take that down. If you're not letting all that power hit the speakers, you're, you're also probably pretty, pretty okay. Um, but yeah, generally you want them to at least match. You know, you don't want to go through a 20 watt cabinet with a 100 watt amp. Uh, that's, that's generally bad news bears. So we, t we don't, gen we generally don't want that. So um, we're going to move on here to cabinet and speaker sizes because that definitely, uh, changes um, one of the one of the biggest things that can change your tone are are your your speakers that both the type and the size and the cabinet cabinet size I think a lot of people may overlook uh, how important the speaker is to your sound you know your amp is definitely super important but depending on what kind of cabinet and what kind of speaker speaker you put it through it's going to change its response it's going to change the type of sound you know um, so we're going to go on uh, here in a bit, and I'll let you know, uh, I'll, I'll let you hear how some of those different cabinet sizes uh, sound. Um, our most popular speaker sizes are generally 8, 10, and 12 inch speakers, sometimes a 15. That was more Fender's thing way back in the day in their like Harvard amps or whatever, you know. Uh, I even think maybe Carvin did like a 15 or something at some point. Generally not as popular, but, but you know, 8, 10, 12. Uh, very popular. We've actually got examples of all of those here today. Uh, the orange amp that we have back here, the Crush 20, 8-inch speaker. The JCM 800 over here actually has a 10-inch speaker, funny enough. Uh, and then the Boss Katana down here has the 12-inch. Now, generally, uh, as, as you go for a larger speaker, you get more low end out of that speaker. They definitely respond differently. Um, eight inch speakers can maybe sound a little boxy, sometimes maybe a little radio-ish. It really depends on how you have the amp set and the size of the box. They, they tend to sound a little boxier. Um, the 10 inch is kind of that happy medium. Like you get a lot of punch out of a 10 inch, uh, very mid-range rich, maybe less, less lows, but they're, they're a very mid-rich speaker and, and uh, common to use you know, in a 110 or even a 210. Fender even made a 410 at one point, and and bless your soul if you've ever gigged with one of those because they're just they're the, they're the biggest heaviest things on the planet. Um, and then your 12 inch is basically again kind of your industry standard, what people most expect in a speaker cabinet in a combo. Having a 12 inch speaker, people are usually like, oh, okay, like the, like this is good. It's got a 12 inch, you know. Um, so let's see, Graham, uh, what are you saying here? Can you play a bass guitar through a standard guitar amplifier? Uh, so you have a Marshall JMP 100 combo. That's really cool. Um, would one damage it by playing bass to the guitar through it? Yes, uh, generally yes. Guitar speakers, and I'm actually glad you asked this, guitar speakers are designed to handle those mid-range frequencies where the guitar sits. 
Uh, whereas bass speakers, you'll see that the wattage is generally way higher uh, on, on uh, bass speakers. They're also designed to just pump out those low notes. Like when you think of a, a frequency wave, you know, your mid-range stuff will probably come across the screen like that, but your low end are these really big, big, deep waves. And when you think about that, the speaker has to move more uh, in order to accommodate the, those lower frequencies. So if you're pumping a bass through that at louder volumes, like you, your speaker's basically going to be doing this so much, trying to pump out all those lows, it, it just, it's just going to tear. It's just going to, or it'll blow. It's, uh, it's generally not good. Um, on the flip side, you absolutely can play a guitar through a bass amp. How good it's going to sound really is... Uh, is going to be the the question. Um, very popular, especially way way back when 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 amps were becoming a thing. Some of the best sounding guitar amps were bass amps at, at the time. Even this, yeah yeah, we've got this like trainer bass made. I played guitar through this thing. It sounds amazing. It's great. Uh, and and you know and this is an older tube amp. Again, tube amps. Thumbs up. But uh, it, it's it's kind of an unfair world where where yes, as a guitar player, you can plug into a bass amp and be fine. The more modern stuff, it probably isn't going to sound as good. But if you plug a guitar into an old bass amp, like an old tube bass amp, good to go. It's so, so good. Um, even uh, you know even some of those bass combos will ha would have a big 15 inch uh, woofer in it. And some of the creamiest I think guitar tones I ever heard were through like a 15. You know, like a tweed 15. Uh, inch speaker uh, amp, really, really cool. So generally, bad idea to play a bass through a through a guitar amp, uh, unless those, you know, yeah, no, I just wouldn't do it. Let's let's leave it at that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so now we and I, so I covered you know open back versus closed back a bit here. Let's go through. We're gonna go through the aux here now. And um, I have six different speakers, uh, speaker presets rigged here uh, so we can hear the differences between them. So just give me a sec now. This, is, uh, th this part is very important. So right now, the amp is connected to itself. Um, it's going from the amp with the internal speaker cable plugged into the speaker. Now I have to unplug this in order to run a speaker cable from the aux into this. So always make sure, turn your amp off. And, and I usually reset the standby uh, when I do this well, just for, the, just for the next time you go to turn it on. So we're going to unplug the speaker cable from the back of the amp. Now, now we basically have this amp going through the aux here, and now it's going direct out of here into our, uh, into our sound, uh, sound board over there. So we'll go ahead and turn this back on. This has also been running for a bit, so it's nice and hot. So generally, you don't have to wait as long for the standby. Um, and we got... Yeah, we got my monitors good here. Okay. So let's go here and turn up. And we're gonna go on the uh, high power, uh, gonna go on the 20 watt uh, for this, okay? So here we go. So this, uh, this right now, this first preset I have is for a 4x12, uh, 4x12 cab, um, 4x12 with greenbacks, uh, so um, pretty universal speaker that we're talking about here. Um, and as you can see, as you can maybe see or maybe not see here, I've actually got the volume up on the amp a bit higher now uh, to kind of compensate for that. Going into this load box, we can actually hear how cranking up this, this master ch changes the sound. Um, I'll do that a little bit more after our kind of speaker comparison here. So right now, so this is going to be our 12 inch, uh, or our 4x12, sorry, okay? So here we go for that. So listen to this, I'll switch it while playing so you can hear the difference. So we're going to go from the 412 to the 112. Okay, so... Just between those two, you can hear that, uh, at least I hope it comes across there, because it, it definitely is coming through here. Between the two cabinets, when you go to the 112, you, you definitely lose a lot of 
um, a lot of low end. It, it, and not in a bad way, it really is just a different kind of sound. The, uh, this 112 also had a green back speaker in it, just like the 412 did. And it was also an open back cabinet, so it was a little airier, again, kind of um, eliminating some of that low end uh, you know, that you would have from the big, big boy 412. But you can, you can hear the, the oomph that the larger cabinet size has on that sound versus when you go to a smaller cabinet, it definitely gets a little boxier. Um, so let's go, I'm gonna now move to preset number three, which is gonna be our, um, I believe is our 212, and this is gonna be kind of a Fender Twin-esque um, 212, which is gonna be kind of funny with a JCM 800 running into it, but, uh, but here, here's how that sounds. So here we're gonna go number three. <laughs> So you can hear with the 212, you kind of get back a bunch of that low end. Uh, the cabinet being a bit larger um, definitely helps. Uh, you know, d don't underestimate the uh, how much your cabinet size Im impacts your sound. Now, I don't think this had greenbacks in it. I think these were probably more, um, you know, maybe vintage Jensen voice, so they maybe had a little bit more um, stiffness on the on that high end there. But definitely brought back a lot of that low end that the 112 was missing. Um, so really goes to show that like just because you have like you know the same speaker uh, uh, doesn't mean that it's going to sound the exact same if the cabinet size is different. So that was the 212. Uh, now let's go to I believe this is going to be the 4x10. I think the next one is here. So let's go ahead and grab that. <laughs> Okay, so as you heard there, so that, that's four tens. So a little, uh, definitely a little bit punchier, even maybe a little more gritty on that top end. And that um, that cabinet too is also an open back four ten, uh, like a Fender Tweed Basement kind of cabinet. So uh, and oh, and by the way, on all of these presets, uh, they're all mic'd with a U sixty seven off axis, um, basically no EQ there, and they all have a bit of plate reverb. So I tried to keep the, the, you know, the mic positioning the exact same for all of them. Um, let's see, Jose, how much of the sound is being attenuated now? Well, so, so I'll cut the direct and let them just hear how it sounds with the monitor. Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah, okay. sure. Sounds good. Right. So that, so that's basically just coming out of a, a reference monitor for myself in here. Definitely something that you could talk over. It, it's it's more than just a quiet jam, you know, uh, sound. But it uh, this could be silent. I could just be listening to that through headphones right now, uh, you know. So it's definitely not. Uh, you you could make this fill the room if you wanted to, uh, depending on how loud your uh, your monitor was. Uh, but generally, you know, a, a, again, a really great thing about this is that you can run these and basically run them silently, run them very quietly. Riley, let's do it one more time. I'll bring in and out the room mic versus the uh, sure, versus sure. direct, okay? Okay, let's do it. So, so, so there you go. So I hope, hopefully that, that helps you there. So again, so that was the, that was the 410. Let's move along. This is going to be a, a 2 by 10 cabinet that we have here next. So here's the 210. <laughs> So 
So that, again, you can hear so much more punch, way more punch, less of that kind of brittly high end. And I think this was a closed back cabinet as well. So two tens, tens can be super punchy. One might set, now you'll see, because the last one I have is gonna be a, a single 10, like a one by 10, which we kind of heard through here as well. You know, so maybe you've kind of already got that reference, but I'll, I'll go through it anyway. Uh, so here's gonna be the next one, which is gonna be a single 10. So, so now I'm actually going to play, so that's the 110. I'm going to switch back and forth between the 2 and the 110 so you can hear the difference while I play because I, I hope it comes across because you can definitely hear it here. So, so here we go. So this is the 110 and I'll switch back. So. So you can hear there, with the two, you're just so much more punchy. It's, it's more full, you know, the, the, the more speakers you have uh, and the larger size of your cabinet, the, kind of, the more full and kind of thick of a sound that you're, that you're probably going to get. Now, you know, we could have a whole nother video talking about different speaker types, you know, and, and all that stuff, um, because there's so many out there and so many that have been made and so many that have a specific purpose. You know, there are, there are speakers that have, um, are more voiced for maybe distorted guitar uh, to give you a different sound, or ones that are more voiced for like a glassier clean. Like, like actually, if I can show you here, um, we'll go back to the four by ten, and I'm going to take the gain down a little bit, and and then we'll we'll see how this sounds kind of in a in a cleaner context. So so here's the four ten. <laughs> So you can see there, it, it definitely, that 410 definitely lends itself to kind of those glassier kind of tones. When you throw a lot of gain at it, it kind of, it, it can get a little fizzy. But again, there are different types of 10 inch speakers that you can go for. But you know, this is just to give you a basic example of how the, those size differences can really impact your sound. Now let's, um, I'm gonna go back to the 412 again and we'll talk a, talk a little bit more about, you know, the, the power attenuation and stuff that, that's in this and, and talk a little bit more about um, how using your master volume can really change your, your guitar sound. So I'm going to go back to the 412 over here and right now again I've got, so I've got my gain down around 2 on the amp uh, and here's what that sounds like through the 412. <laughs> And now for that, I've got, you know, the master's up about halfway. So I'm actually going to, in the next little bit, I'm going to drop it down a little. And, and it's definitely going to get a little, a little quieter as well. But you'll also hear the, the dynamic difference. So I'm going to go a little lower. And as I play, I'm going to turn it up without touching the gain. So the gain is going to be on about 2 o'clock until I decide to turn it up. So, uh, so here's the master kind of down at 2. To, now we're back up to five. So you can see there, so now, now that's the volume at 10. The gain is still on two. So this, so even though this is like a master volume amp, um, you can get those really kind of classic like plexi sounds by keeping the gain kind of low and then just gunning the volume. Now this, if this was coming through the speaker, if this wasn't attenuated by this or anything like that, my, we'd, be blowing, we'd be blowing our ears off. This would not be very pleasant. Even at 20 watts, even at 20 watts, like it's still loud and we're in like a closed room. So. 
Uh, definitely something to keep in mind. Now I'm gonna uh, now I'm gonna do the the uh, something a little different. I'm gonna turn the volume back down a little lower, and then we'll we'll give you an example of how the gain sounds when you're trying to get a dirtier tone at a lower volume. You'll see the difference in fullness uh, with it there. So so let's go ahead and do that. We're gonna bring the master back. I'm gonna put it probably about three or four, and then again here's what it sounds like at two. Now we're going to bring it up uh, to about half, so at five there. Now we're going to bring uh, the gain up to about eight, and again, keeping that volume relatively low. Okay, now let's do a little experiment. I'm going to turn the gain and the volume all the way up together. You can see it gets a little hummy, so, so, and here's what that sounds like. that disgustingness out of here but but you can hear how much fatter and fuller the amp sounds with the with, with the master turned up um, which is why I, th I think you know I will always kind of advocate for um, may maybe a lower wattage tube option because because the minute you get you get it cooking and you get that volume up usually it's about past two once you can kind of get it to that two to five range there's so much body that comes out of a, a tube amp, it's it's amazing. Like when you keep it at one or below one, you really like it. It's like nobody's home, um, which is why what it makes owning a tube amp nowadays pretty um, pretty hard and and pretty complicated. It's it's less realistic now, um, but on on the flip side, more realistic now that you have uh, pieces of gear like this, piece of gear that where you can get really amazing like like that is studio level quality cabinet speaker and mic emul emulations you know if you heard that on a recording like you would you would never know you'd never know you wouldn't have a way of knowing so um, as much of a um, maybe more analog person that, that I consider myself to be you know being a big fan of tube amps I feel that that mixed with the the digital technology we have is, is going to be it really is the future if, if we're if it's not already in terms of being able to record uh, and and being able to to play at home and all that so um, really really great now I guess that you know kind of the last part of of our show today um, you know what what amp is right for me out of out of everything you heard today you know we're all in different um, we're all in different at different points in our lives maybe we have maybe we're single and we live alone and we can make as much noise as we want Maybe we've got uh, we've got little ones that have to go to sleep, and you can't make any noise. So now you have to potentially sacrifice the the quality of your tone that you're getting at home, and that's never fun. So what it, you know what is going to be right for me? Uh, you know, am I am I gigging? Are you playing shows? Do you have a band? Are you playing with a drummer? You know, all these things that we talked about about volume. Do you have enough volume, or do you have too much of it? You know. Um, does anyone have any more questions uh, for me to ask, uh, or, or to ask me? I'd, I'd be happy to answer them as, as much as I can. I mean, um, if you want to hear any more of what's going on here, if you, uh, you know, want to uh, talk about settings, what do, what do we got here? So, let's see. What uh, Michael asks, uh, what are differences between acoustic amps and electric amps? Oh, good. Yeah, good question. Good question. Um, the biggest difference: uh, acoustic amps are full range generally. Meaning that they have, uh, you know, a woofer and usually and uh, a mid-range and, and a tweeter. It'll be like a, like a home stereo speaker almost. Um, those are great for acoustic amps uh, and vocals because they give you that full range, especially that delicate top end that that tweeter uh, gets you. With an electric amp, you generally don't have that. Again, the, it, it, mainly the speaker in the electric guitar amp is designed just to just to give you those mid-range frequencies where the guitar sits. So generally they're not 
they're not as interchangeable. Um, some digital options, some digital amps will give you a full range speaker off the bat. Uh, and, um, and sometimes with those amps, if you have the full range control on and you're not using an acoustic through them, uh, it's not quite going to sound right. It might sound a little fizzy on the top. So some options actually give you uh, a way to turn off the tweeter, which is nice. In general, I'd say they're not really interchangeable. If you need to amplify your acoustic, I recommend an acoustic amp. It's going to sound miles better for that acoustic. Um, Graham uh, says, I've never understood what the presence control does. Can you explain, please? Absolutely, uh, definitely. And we'll go back to this and I'll have, I actually had the presence set to zero on this amp the whole time. Uh, because uh, th what the presence does, um, what the presence does is it basically uh, acts as that really crispy top end in your EQ. It's all that really that delicate brightness on top. And the JCM800 is a very bright amp in general. So for this demo, um, I actually I even have the treble pretty low on the amp, and and actually the presence is on zero. So if you want, um, here I'll give it a I'll give it a play here, and we'll we'll keep going through the aux. Uh, there, Matt, uh, for that 412 <laughs> kind of sound. So, um, so this is the presence at zero, and I'll see if I can chug along a little bit. And uh, apologize uh, for my back to you guys. I'm just going to chug while I while I turn the presence knob. So it's at zero here. So now we're going to start turning it up. So now now it's at ten right there. So you can see the crispy. And, that, and that's back to zero. So now you can hear there, it's it basically all that crispy top edge is, is kind of rolled off. Now you can set that to wherever you want. If you have a particular dark sounding guitar um, or even dark sounding speakers, if, if anything, if you want to make up for a bit of brightness there, um, that's what that presence controller really does. It's really subtle. Uh, and it, it took me years to kind of hear it. Like I didn't really know what I was listening for. Um, and I think the louder it is in the room, I think it's a, a little easier to uh, I think I think it's a little easier to, to hear it when the volume's uh, up a little bit. Um, presence is probably a really good thing if you like a clean sound. Um, and again, here actually, I can even see if I can I can uh, demo that a little bit for you here. So let's turn the gain down a little bit. Try and master up, and then let's do so. So I'm going to be on the neck pickup here again, still going through the aux of the 412 settings. <laughs> So that's with our presence at zero. And that's with it up at like seven. I'm going to turn it up to ten now. How much of that again? How much of that sparkliness kind of kind of got rolled off uh, there when, when I when I turned it down? So yeah, presence control. I actually kind of though it really depends on your style. Like I'm a very um, uh, I'm a very like Brit. Like I love Marshall stuff. I'm, I'm a very big rock and roll guy. Uh, so for a lot of that stuff, you know, depending on what you're going for, um, depending on what you're going for, that presence control, you can either like hardly use it or or use it all the time. So. Um, now, now, Reg, about your question, show the aux attenuating with the Marshall. Um, I actually, that's one thing I actually can't do today uh, because the speaker cable built into the amp is a really small built-in cable that's attached directly to the speaker and I actually it doesn't come out long enough for me to plug it into, um, uh, for me to plug it in there. Um, lots of great demos though on, on YouTube about the aux, like that, you know, uh, I know this seems like aux feature hour, but Lots of great videos actually showing its attenuation capabilities. It's the one thing I can't really do uh, at this point. So I'm sorry about that. I didn't bring uh, the appropriate cable for that. So sorry about that. Um, but it, it is really, it is really great. Um, one thing that uh, one thing the aux actually does uh, is that depending on the level of attenuation that you have here, because I can tell you a bit about it. 
uh, depending on how quiet you put it, there is actually some active EQ going on in the amp. Because generally when you attenuate something, you use an attenuator, um, it can sometimes roll off a bunch of high-end frequencies or low-end frequencies. It can actually change how it sounds a little bit. So, um, so the, what, what the attenuation does, what they did on the aux, is it automatically, depending on what it's set to, it actually listens to what's coming out of the amp and EQs it appropriately for the estimated you know, volume that you'll have it at. So really advanced piece of gear there. And there are some other power attenuators that will have um, compensated EQs. They'll, they might have a bright switch or a, or a deep switch or something to, to compensate for some of those lower high-end frequencies. I know like the Rock Crusher gives you like a, a, a graphic EQ that you can use. Um, sometimes you need to, sometimes you don't. I, I get, this is one of those things I find the better power attenuator you buy, the, the less you have to worry about kind of colored or, 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 or uh, um, affected natural sound. Uh, let's see here. So how is presence different from treble, asks Phil. So Phil, um, treble is your general high end. It, it all has to do with the frequency range that it adjusts. Treble is your is most of your high end. The presence is like your ultra high end, like it, you know, probably past the, I, I, I don't actually know the for sure frequency sweep of it. You know, if I had to guess, it, it's probably anything like maybe six or seven K and up. Maybe somebody else in the comments can correct me on that. Your, tre your treble is your basic high end. Your presence is your like your super high end, more delicate frequencies. Um, Mark says, for an 80s rock sound for a beginner, which amp would you recommend and, and why? Oh man, um, probably, honest, probably the Katana, uh, one that I, they, there's also a 50 watt version that they make. Um, a really great thing with digital is you can get a whole range of really great sounding distortion. Um, and that 80s rock distortion stuff, that stadium reverb, all those things are, are basically included in a lot of those modeling amps. I think for what I've seen people use them for and the amount that we've sold of them, I think, I, really, I think the Katana is really great. Um, probably a Spider for that as well too, depending. Uh, I think the Spider has a little bit more menu diving uh, than one may like. It really depends, uh, but they do give you more menu options for those tones. Um, Line 6 Spider has a, uh, oh, what do they call it? It's um, They do have like a Slash-esque preset in there that is just unreal. So. Definitely, I'd look into those. Um, Alexander asks, uh, any advice connecting two tube combos together? Oh, A, a versus B. Um, actually, pretty pretty all right there. So that if you want to go A, B, um, you just get an A, B box. Uh, it really doesn't have anything to do with the load on the speakers. Um, you're really just, you're just getting a, a, a pedal or a box and they're pretty readily available where you just hook up regular guitar patch cable uh, from the box to either your amps, and then it just switches which one it, it allows signal to. Uh, so like Radial makes one, ART makes them, um, pretty easy there. Most of them are even a, uh, like ABY, which meaning that you can have uh, one, or, one or the other of the amps, or you can have them both on at the same time. So that's totally fine. You definitely wouldn't use the speaker outputs on the back of the amp to do that. It, that's just a, a signal thing. So if you search AB or ABY box, you know, I think they start at maybe the $50 range, probably going up to 100, 120, depending on the model or whichever one you want. Uh, let's see, uh, Mark. Uh, so Mark asks, uh, are there good digital modeling amps that, uh, that are also Bluetooth for wireless headphones? Oh, um, Bluetooth wireless headphones. Uh, not, that, not that I'm aware, there probably are, um, but may, uh, they might not be things that we carry. I'm not as familiar with them. Um, yeah, sorry about that. I don't. I don't know if I, Bluetooth is a funny thing. Bluetooth is definitely something that is getting more and more popular uh, over the last few years. Like Katana even has their Air, you know, their Katana Air, where you can Bluetooth your phone there and and play music through it and play along with stuff. So they're they're kind of there. And uh, wireless technology, I think, is getting better and better now. I'm not aware of one that that do Bluetooth for wireless headphones though. So maybe I might take a little more research even even on my part. So uh, sorry about that, Mark. Uh, let's see, so Graham, uh, Positive Grid Spark is a highly promoted amplifier, isn't it any good? I've seen those demos too, uh, I don't know. I don't know, in the demos it sounds really good and it looks like it's compact enough. There's, um, that's definitely a market that's getting, um, that's getting flooded. Uh, 
nowadays, like, like, or sorry, it seems to be that there's more demand for stuff like that, like those really small digital amplifiers um, that give you all this great modeling in a smaller package. Like, I think one of the first ones I knew of was like Yamaha did like the, what is it, the YTR or the THR10 or something like that, um, that was great. Um, definitely more of that coming around. That spark I would love to try. Um, I don't know if it's, I don't believe it's something that Long McQuaid carries yet, so uh, if we ever do, I'll definitely give it a run through. Seems cool. Um, Frank asks, what, uh, why does my JSM 800 amp sound like it's popping once in a while? Probably because it is. Um, I mean, there's a few, there's a few different things. Um, if you find that, uh, I should pre, I should preface this by saying there's a lot of things that affect how your guitar sounds and how your amp sounds in terms of interference. You basically have a piece of wood with magnets in it that are designed to pick up a whole bunch of stuff. So if you have, uh, if you're sitting with your phone in your pocket, um, if you're sitting in front of a computer screen, a TV screen, if you're, the room you're in has fluorescent lights, it can cause a bunch of different bits of interference here and there. Like, I, it, you know, if you notice sometimes even if you do this, you know, to and fro a bit, uh, you can um, either filter out certain sounds or they'll pick up certain sounds. On a bit of a um, more techy note, I suppose, if it pops um, and if it also kind of sounds like, if it sounds like there's wind blowing through it, like it sounds like somebody's actually blowing like wind into a microphone and it kind of pops a little bit. Uh, if it's an older amp, you probably need the filter caps changed. Filter caps are one of those things I was talking to at the beginning of parts that have a shelf life and need to be replaced every once in a while. Those filter caps every 30, 30 to 40 years, I think it might may even, even be less. It just depends on how often the amp gets used. So um, I would try a few of those little things first. See if it's your phone. Um, see if it's the lights. If you're sitting in front of a computer monitor, if it's doing that, when you're doing that, good way to troubleshoot it. If not, definitely take the amp into a tech and have a look. Any more questions there, guys? Um, you know, please, uh, you know, I think we're going to start, we're going to wrap it up here uh, very shortly. So if you got any more questions, you know, fire them in. I'm, I'm happy to answer what I can. Um, I definitely tried to give as much of a demo as this stuff as I could. Um, definitely more of a one-on-one -on -one thing. Maybe we'll come back and do uh, some more uh, in-depth things. Please let us know if there's anything specific you want us to talk about or, or anything that you want to hear more about, anyone that you maybe want to have on. Uh, really great. So Stan uh, says, can you just replace individual tubes or should you replace the entire set? Good question. Uh, yeah, great question. Generally for, so if we're talking preamp tubes, usually you can just replace, you know, one or two of them uh, until they all kind of die. Um, how are we, how we going to go about this? So generally like, you know, your the first preamp tube there that you have is the one that gets the most use out of it. It's usually the first one to go. It's not like they all tend to like go at the same time. Um, so with, with preamp tubes, you can usually just swap one in and out as you need. Um, but then again, you know, you kind of leave it to your judgment. If you haven't um, done the tubes in your amp in a while, it's probably worth it to just do a fresh whole set. With power tubes, you should replace them in, in pairs. Uh, uh, pairs or, or quads, however you want to go. Um, power tubes, and, and actually I, I probably forgot to cover this, so, so very, I'm glad you asked. Um, your power tubes are generally in matched pairs, meaning that they are designed to operate, uh, meaning that they're designed to operate within the same, uh, you know, power spectrum, within the same spectrum of each other, uh, so that it runs properly. So generally you don't want to just pop one in and out, they could be mismatched, it could, you know, cause a few annoying things for you. Um, so definitely change them in pairs or just change, if you have four of them, it, probably best to just change them all. Uh, if you want more info on this, definitely, you know, um, uh, talk to a tech uh, to, to get a little more detailed. But yeah, yeah, I would say preamp tubes, fine. Power tubes, definitely change them in pairs. Anthony asked me what my favorite amp is. Oh, oh man. Um, I would say the 800 is probably in there uh, as one of my favorites. I also own a, um, a clone of a 1967 Marshall JTM 50, which is this really cool transitional amp between um, the JTM 45 in 1966 and their uh, Marshall's 50 watt super lead. Um, so this JTM 50, they also called it the Black Flag amp. Like I'm a big ACDC fan, Angus Young is my jam. Uh, and I found out that that JTM 50 is actually the uh, his was his main amp for a lot of the recordings from like set you know seventy nine to like eighty four which is for me like prime DC guitar tone 
Uh, so that, I would say, is probably my favorite amp. Um, next to the JCM800, I like the 800 because it has a master volume. It's a little more modern sounding. It's not necessarily high gain, but for the kind of stuff I like, it offers plenty of gain. You know, so I, I would say that. I do have a soft spot for a lot of other ones, though. Uh, you know, any old Fender amps that I've gotten to play I, I have just been a, a different flavor and a different love. I don't think it really, I don't think it really stops at just one. Uh, I think there's a lot out there. Like if I had endless funds, I tell you, I'd have more uh, uh, amps taking up more space than I could probably walk in the house, a la Joe Bonamassa. <laughs> so, um, okay, guys. Well, I, I think we're gonna wrap it up there. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, again, my name's Riley. This was Guitar Amps 101. If you have any more questions regarding this, you know, please feel free to shoot us uh, along with a message. Call any of us at any of the stores, and we'll do our best to help you out. Um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. And I want to say thanks to Matt for operating the sound while I was doing all this. Uh, I hope it sounded great out there. It sounded good in here. So, uh, yeah, you take care, everybody. Thanks a lot.